just before I started school, that's when, I, or at least these are the first memories um, that I have of actually having difficulty with this um, disease. And, and, you know, I remember not fully understanding what was going on, but I was definitely before, um, be- it was definitely before I started school. So we're talking about, you said, four to five years of age. That's when we typically, we see it. Um, now, in terms of um, why you, I guess, hold back on diagnosing it um, early, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because some kids get better. Okay. You know, some children will have a couple of bouts of wheezing when they're little, mm-hmm. and then they get better. You know, in children who there's a strong family history, you know, everybody has asthma in the family, or in a young child who already has an allergy history, you know, maybe they have very bad eczema, maybe they've had allergies to foods when they're one or two years of age. Sometimes those children, that sort of predicts that maybe they're going to go on to continue to have asthma. Now, I don't know if we're going to, well, we're going to speak about this further in the segment, but just to start it off, my understanding of asthma and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this inflammation in the lungs, your body is fighting something, and it's the buildup of a lot of mucus. Correct. And because of that, it's very very difficult to breathe. Right. Mm -hmm. What happens is, imagine our airways are little tubes, right? And imagine you're a little kid, right? A little baby or a young child has their tubes are the size of a dime or the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. And that gets swollen. I always tell parents, think about what it's like when you have a cold, right? When you have a cold, what happens? Your nose gets swollen. You can't breathe through it, and you make a lot of mucus. That same thing is going on in your lungs, right? Your lungs get swollen. Mm -hmm. You make a lot of mucus, and you can breathe in because your body works really hard to help you breathe in. But then when you go to try and breathe out, everything collapses. So it's just like having when you can't breathe through your nose, you can't breathe through your lungs. Same kind of thing. Got it. So so going um, back one more time to... What we were That's saying okay. with the with the <laughs> with the young children we're and them and the, you know <laughs> they can we, play football. <laughs> <laughs> so when we have um, children that do come in with wheezing, let's say the parent had has another child that has asthma. Should this parent be maybe a little bit more um, proactive in saying that you know, look, this is a uh, wheezing. This is might not be a, a typical cold, and bring that child in for evaluation. Right. Most of the time we make the diagnosis of asthma by our clinical exam mm-hmm. and by the history. So the parent gives us a history of coughing, coughing at night, coughing with running around. The parent gives us a history, a family history of asthma, and then mm-hmm. we examine the child. And we listen to the child and we hear wheezing and sometimes we see the children having distress. You know, they are what we call retracting, like you can see their, their uh, ribs moving in mm-hmm. and out or up and down. And we, and we say, all right, this child is wheezing. And then we may go ahead and try asthma medication, usually by an inhaler medicine or what we call a nebulizer. And if the child improves, Mm -hmm. if their work of breathing improves and we listen and they're not wheezing anymore, we know then that we have some what we call reactive airways. And again, maybe go on to have asthma. If the child is one, we'll see what happens and it's their first time. If it's their fifth time, we kind of sort of have the diagnosis that we have something more chronic going on. Got it. No, um, I want to tr- uh, clear up because I have a couple of myths mm-hmm. on my paper right here. You got here. myths? Okay. Yeah, so one mm-hmm. of them is, that especially in this community, one of the reasons why children have asthma could be two reasons, pollution and asbestos in the, in the old apartments. Is that true? Is that? that is not environment in the home and in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Very important triggers of asthma very important. What goes on in your home is so important to why kids wheeze. It's less about asbestos and more about mold and cockroaches, vermin, dust. Mm-hmm. dust. We find that New York City has done a lot of statistics on asthma and we were discussing before we came on the air that poor communities have two and three times the rates of asthma Correct. as other communities. And a lot of it has to do, some of it is inherited. We were discussing one in five Hispanic children have asthma, one in six black children have asthma. Mm -hmm. But we know that kids in poor neighborhoods like Central Harlem, East Harlem, um, Hunts Point, Bushwick in Brooklyn, um, and we know that a lot of it is their environment. Kids live in homes that have broken windows, crack windows, mold, cockroaches, Cockroaches, mice. Mm -hmm. These kids have more asthma. Very important. 
And certainly cities, big cities, have more asthma because there's more pollution. In a city like New York where mm -hmm. we have all these buildings and all the stuff kind of stays in the air, we have a lot more asthma. Yeah. Absolutely. Asbestos is not as much as some of these other things. Cockroaches is a bad one. Every kid who has mm -hmm. asthma is allergic to cockroaches. Ooh. Right. So it's very important in terms of the treatment of asthma. It's not only Got to it. prescribe medications, but to get change the home the environment. environment as best you can. Now, my thing is, when you say allergic to cockroaches, is that because of what they carry on them? As far as why would you say cockroaches? Well, it's only that? what they carry, but it's also you know their protein and stuff. The that okay, made got of. you. I don't like to think about it too much, but okay. <laughs> I, never, I never heard of that. But that's right. good to know. Never yeah, that. and then yeah. we could talk about smoking. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. So that's that. that's the thing, and we, and um, basically, what we going back to what this disease is. We, we said we talked about the the constriction of the airways. They tighten up. We got the mucus production, right. and this is all in response to um, as, as Dr. Denofo just said, it could be the proteins that are found in in cockroach feces and on the cockroaches themselves. It could be um, proteins or other things that could be found in the the fecal matter of of mice it could be dust mites it could be all of these different dust things can set people yeah. off and it might not be the same thing for each individual child but right. um when we talk about you know the more the more you're exposed to the more things that could potentially set someone off and mold is another one and mold, mold is, is another is a one huge another. problem right. so these are all things that could lead to or trigger um an asthma attack right um and we're about to take a break, ladies and gentlemen, so stay with us because we're going to go more in depth with this. Um, you're listening to Health in Harlem on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. If you wish to call in with any questions, comments, or concerns, you can call us at 212-650-6903. That's 212-650-6903. You're listening to Health in Harlem. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, and if oh okay. You are you are the first... The part, Ryan, I'm just going to say the first caller. All right, there we go. If you are the first caller, hit us off. I'm pulling out my cell phone right now. And you will receive a prize <laughs> of unspeakable value. So I'm going <laughs> to keep saying this every single Can week. Can I call? <laughs> 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 I'm going to keep saying this every single week until somebody hits us off. But you know what? Someone is going to hit us off, and confetti is going to fall out the sky. All right, there we go. <laughs> You're listening to Health in Harlem. We'll be right back. Stay with us. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. If you know the symptoms and get the facts, you'll know the signs of a heart attack. Women, listen to me, and when I'm done, if it sounds familiar, call 911. Pain in the neck, just arms a jaw. John is the breath, please tell us more. Cold sweats and nausea, tiredness. It's time to take it serious. Back pain, stomach pain, shortness of breath, cold sweats, nausea, dizziness. If you know the symptoms and heed the signs, you'll be around for a long, long time. Women, listen to me, and when I'm done, if any sound familiar, call 911. Learn the song that can save your life. Get a free download at womenshealth.gov slash heart attack. Women, listen to me, and when I'm done, if any sound familiar, call 911. If any sound familiar, call 911. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Este 17 de mayo contamos contigo para seguir dando más a nuestra comunidad. Necesitamos tu aporte en nuestro Radio Maratón Anual desde las 8 de la mañana hasta las 8 de la noche. No falte. Ven, te esperamos. Llámanos al 212-650-6903. Hi, I'm Vinny B of the Vinny B Showcase. Tune in every Thursday from 8 to 12 midnight for some solid cultural roots music and some sweet lovers rock. Also, informative interviews and giveaways. Right here on the Vinny B Showcase every Thursday, 8 through 12 midnight on WHCR, 90.3 FM. Peace. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Yeah. 
Welcome back to the one and only Health in Harlem on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. I'm Maurice Selby. And this is Sean Shivers. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Dr. Elaine Dinofo. She is a general pediatrician from Harlem Hospital, and we're talking about asthma tonight. Asthma. Critically important disease. Especially and, this community. And and I'm going to keep saying absolutely. Yes. No, it is. You're right. 30% of kids in Harlem have yes. asthma. And you, you mentioned something earlier to me, um, Dr. Dinofo, before the show about um, how serious this disease can be. And we're talking about, ultimately, I mean, if this is not controlled, uh, death is Right. I mean, some children do can... die from asthma, certainly younger children and adolescents who are not in good control uh, can die from asthma. Mm -hmm. you know? A lot of kids go to the emergency room with asthma, a huge number of ER visits every year, especially in emergency rooms in poor neighborhoods. And as I said, it's the number one admission to the hospital for children under wow. the age of 14. What's interesting is that we're seeing fewer admissions for asthma in the last few years because we're doing a better job about getting kids on controller medicines. Mm -hmm. But the kids that are getting admitted are sicker. We're seeing more kids mm -hmm. in ICUs wow. who are getting admitted. It's not quite mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why that is, but we're seeing mm -hmm. a little bit more of that. So um, about, a some bad news. about a couple of months ago, one of the employees in my department <coughs> had a sudden asthma attack. Mm -hmm. Sent her downstairs to the ER mm -hmm. and in the corner of the ER, there had to be about six or seven other people in the corner with these inhalers right. on Nebulizer their face. Mm. What was happening? Can, can you tell me what was happening? Or especially because because uh, anybody experienced who comes to the ER and they have asthma, I'm assuming that they're going to go in that same corner also. Right. Most emergency rooms have areas for people with asthma and they're set up to have oxygen uh, on the walls. And then what you are doing <coughs> with the mask is it's called nebulizer and you are giving asthma medicine with oxygen oh, okay. via nebulizer right because a lot of times when people are having an asthma attack their oxygen is low that's part of why mm -hmm. asthma is dangerous for you right your oxygen goes down and so that's the medication that they're giving wow because right. I, I know definitely that if you come into the er with an asthma and people always talk about long ways at Harlem hospital no you're going straight in to the back and put on this mechanism. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Right. So Again, because sometimes if you come in really, really tight, you were telling me about a patient mm -hmm. you had, you're really tight and you don't get treated right away, you can die. Yeah. Stop wow. breathing. And, and even if we're not talking about death, um, just going back just a little bit, where you mentioned the, the hospital admission rate, and I can tell you there were times where I was in a hospital for um, pretty much a whole week, missing a whole week of school. Um, you know, not at home with my family. And, and there's the psychological and emotional issues that you deal with with being in the hospitals as a child. No children, no child should be in the hospital. We, we want children to be out playing and, um, you know, learning the ways of life. Uh, and we, when we just look at the school, the missed school days, um, all of these things add up. The parents having to take off from work uh, to stay home with the child or somebody having to, having to be there to watch the child. Um, now we're talking about loss of productivity, loss of income. So it goes far beyond just talking about, you know, uh, life and death, which is, of course, of the utmost importance. But when we talk about the day to day, um, how this can disrupt, disrupt the day to day life of a family, then we're talking about how serious this this uh, disease can be um, economically, educationally for the child. Mm -hmm. And this is where when we talk about um, classification of the disease or mm -hmm. se severity of the disease um, and you mentioned control this is why it's mm -hmm. paramount to have control of this disease well I, well, I want to make a comment real quick and then you can um, sure. you can comment afterward is that I, w I went to it when I was at Asthmatic Children's Foundation I do I went to a training and they said they said I want everybody to be aware of what a child or someone goes through and they have an asthma attack so they said I want you to do 20 jump jumping jacks so we did 20 jumping jacks he said now hold your breath and don't let go. Right. And just after a matter of, let's say, about uh, 30 seconds, I was about to drop dead. So th is, is that a good analogy to yeah. use when someone's yeah. having an asthma yeah. attack? Right, or you can take the stairs to come up here. From <laughs> 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 and that'll do it. No, it's true, because what happens is you get anxious, right? You, you're having trouble breathing. 
your oxygen's a little bit low, and you get more anxious. And the more anxious you get, the harder it is for mm. you to breathe. And especially in older kids, that anxiety is really there. Little yeah. ones don't really know it. They or that fear, I guess it's like a fear. But then you have a fear, you know, that I can't breathe, and you're gasping for air, and that's absolutely what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And you want to avoid that. And you're absolutely right. You know, you shouldn't be sitting in a hospital a week. You should be in school. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be in school. You should be playing your sports and doing all your activities if it means you have to take medicine every day then so be it you have to take medicine every day but medicine doesn't shouldn't prevent you from doing things it should help you to do things that's right so when we talk about um management of this this disease when we talk about management of this disease and you know um improving some of these things making sure that the child can go to school on a how how effective can the treatment be like if we have control of it how effective can if we do it right it be? should be very effective and every child is different mm -hmm. every child is different every family is different so we actually have you were we were discussing criteria the national heart lung blood institute has come up with uh, sort of an algorithm for, for doctors to use to mm -hmm. help them manage children with asthma. And it's a little bit arbitrary because you ask a lot of questions of their parent. You know, how many days does your child cough? How many days does your child wake up at night? How many times a week do you have to give him his short-acting albuterol? But it gives us an idea of how chronic the child's illness is and then you figure out medication to manage him. Got it. And the whole point is getting the child under control so that you know, he's not coughing every night of the week, mm -hmm. that he's, you know, not missing school. And the schools, you know, here in New York City, there's been a big push by the Board of Education to have asthma programs in the school, to have everyone educated about asthma so that kids can bring their asthma inhaler to school and stay in school all day. So these are all good things. And so you ha each kid is different. You have to figure out what's going to work for him, what medications will work, what medications won't work, what the parent is able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, whether the child is can use an inhaler, whether a younger child needs a nebulizer, Got all it. these different kinds of things. But what you do is you work with the patient, you work with the family, and you figure out what's going to work What's going to work the best. best, you know, regimen of medications that's going to work for him so he can go have his life. All right, that's what I'm talking about. I want to clear up, a, I'm going to throw another myth out there. Um, okay. <laughs> one of the myths is saying is that um, if you or your child is having an asthma attack, give them a cup of hot tea. If you or your child is having an asthma attack, you give your child or yourself medication. If you don't get better after 20 minutes, you pick up the phone or you come to the emergency room. Got to clear that up. That makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Have you heard that before by any chance? Of um, tea, honey. Honey is good for kids who cough who don't have asthma. Mm -hmm. But if you're yeah. coughing because you're having asthma, you have to take your asthma medicine. Got you. Okay. And, and one of the things that Sean brought up earlier was um, I think sometimes people fear um, the wait, not even the hospital itself, but just being in the emergency room, having to wait around. And, and they don't want to go. And to yeah, people do not want to go to the emergency room which is totally understandable and you know what for certain uh things certain things can wait till tomorrow um and we talked about the cold the the cold and the runny noses and a little bit of wheezing that that young children can have with viral infections mm -hmm. and guess what that can wait until you go to your primary care physician maybe the next day um that can wait for sure and and actually if the parent is really confident and and understands on um, these colds and they know their child they can even they won't have to go to a primary care physician at all because a lot of those um, subside on their own however when we talk about asthma we talk about something that is potentially emergent at any given moment and if if this is not controlled if we don't get the right treatment at the right time we could have some serious um, serious complications as a result and this is why this is a truly emergent disease and Sean, you did point out that there's sort of an express line in the emergency room that any child coming in with asthma uh, or, or symptoms um, consistent with asthma, these children are on the express, express track versus I everyone risk. else in the, yep. in the emergency room. But if we get our kids on the right meds and if we teach the children and <coughs> teach parents how to manage mild asthma attacks, and the parents good parents can learn you know anything and kids older especially older as kids get older they can learn to know their own body mm. and know when they're really sick you can manage some asthma at home but that's only if you have a good relationship with your 
your doctor, with your primary care doctor, or the person who takes care of you with your asthma, some kids see a specialist, and that you are a very well-educated parent about managing your kid's mm -hmm. asthma. Sometimes you can do some things at home, but most kids who are having a bad asthma attack, no tea, emergency. No tea, emergency. Yes, and, and I just want to give credit to my mom if she's listening because, <laughs> because I think she hey, was mom. good. In terms of managing <laughs> my asthma, um, not only did she have the information, and this is where we can see what we we're talking about um, uh, in terms of being ready to deal with this disease and having the right information because she would do certain things that, um, as uh, well, one thing for sure, if the nebulizer treatment or my inhaler didn't work initially after, uh, um, you know, a certain amount of time or after a couple of treatments, then we were on our way to the emergency room. That was a fact that was hands down no matter what time uh, of day it was. If it was in the middle of the night, which a lot of asthma attacks occur in the middle of the night, we were on our way you if those treatments asthma? didn't work. So occasionally, and we can talk about triggers well, because a little more too. Because the question I was like, yeah. uh, um, as you gotten older, do you have less attacks or no attacks at all? For the most part, I grew out of it. Um, however, certain things, and my, one of my main triggers when I was younger was cold, dry air, which to this day, if I'm exerting myself in cold, dry air, I could still, I'll still feel my chest tighten up sometimes. Um, and it might not be as severe as it was when I was younger, but that still happens. And this, remember, we were talking about hyper responsiveness of the airways um, that doesn't necessarily go away uh, completely as you get older. It might get a little better, but it doesn't completely Go away. Well, actually, but, well, I'm going to do a flip real quick. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a flip real quick. Recently, I just went to my primary care physician because it felt like I've been wheezing. And they had told me to try an inhaler. But then they're going to monitor. So now you, I'm just going to say, you kind of sort of grew out of it. And I, I get the feeling, hasn't been You're diagnosed yet, that I'm starting to develop it. Develop it. And, and, yeah, yeah, sometimes that can happen that you can get asthma as an adult. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I had my first asthma attack when I was thirty. Mm. Oh wow! So it can happen. Um, sometimes it's something that just you know maybe you've gotten one of these viruses that's flying around and that's why you're wheezing with it. Um, but it is true that sometimes people do get it when they're adults. Mm. Um, but it is more common to have it when you're a child, and maybe get better as you get older. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you're always a little susceptible to every once in a while having an asthma attack. Got mm. it. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Health in Harlem on WHCR 90.3 FM New York, the voice of Harlem. You can call us at 212-650-6903. That's 212-650-6903. And you can even hit us up on Facebook. Type in Health in Harlem in the search box on Facebook. Bam. Sean and I will pop up right there with our bad boy pose. Jeez, and you can <laughs> <laughs> and you can leave your questions, comments, or concerns right there, and we'll try our best to address them uh, before the show's end. So keep that dial right there. We'll be right back. This is Health in Harlem on WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Earthquake Entertainment presents the live concert series on Friday, May 3rd at 8 p.m. The live concert series will feature live African drums and dance by Dar Essence. Enjoy an exciting evening with special guest Day as he performs your favorite hits from the 90s to the present. That's the live concert series held on Friday, May 3rd at the Oberia Dempsey Theater. Doors open at 7.30 p.m. Show starts at 8 p.m. The Oberia Dempsey Theater is located at 127 West 127th Street between Lenox and 7th Avenues. For tickets and more information, call 917-364-8053. That's 917-364-8053. Or visit www.earthquake-ent.com. Hi, I'm Vinny B of the Vinny B Showcase. Tune in every Thursday from 8 to 12 midnight 
for some solid cultural roots music and some sweet lovers rock. Also, informative interviews and giveaways. Right here on the Villaby Showcase every Thursday, 8 through 12 midnight on WHCR, 90.3 FM. Peace. WHCR, 90.3 FM, New York. Welcome back to Health in Harlem, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Maurice Selby. And this is Sean Shivers. And tonight we have with us Dr. Elaine Denolfo from Harlem Hospital. She's a pediatrician, and we're talking about asthma tonight, ladies and gentlemen. But before we get back to our conversation, I just have a brief announcement to make. Now, before we informed you about the typical uh, times of the year when, when the hospitals or even the state as a whole is short on blood. And ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching that time. Okay. And that is why next Promise week season. there is a blood drive, May 9th, next Thursday, 2013. There will be a blood drive at Harlem Hospital, and they want you to come out and donate your blood. They want you to roll up your sleeve and donate blood to help others in your community who suffer from sickle cell disease, blood disorders, and other potentially life-threatening conditions. The blood drive will be held at Harlem Hospital, and, and the main entrance is on 135th Street and Lenox Avenue, right across the street from the Schomburg Center. The New York City Blood Center staff will be set up in the second floor gallery of the hospital. Yep. This is the Martin Luther King Pavilion. Uh, and the actual donation itself takes about 10 minutes. That's it. However, the benefits can last a lifetime yes, they for can. another individual. So bring a friend, Save make a, a difference together. And guess what? You get snacks at the end of it. You said you free? You get like sun chips and stuff, huh? Free. Free. Yes. Totally free. Sun yeah. chips, I apple love that juice. Word. That's my favorite yeah. part, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, Breakfast. <laughs> so remember, we have this blood drive next week, Thursday, May 9th, 2013 at Harlem Hospital. 135th Street and Lenox Avenue in the second floor gallery. You can register at 212-939-1327 or you can even walk in uh, to donate. Remember, you can call 212-939-1327 or just walk in to donate some blood. All right. So uh, getting back to our conversation, we kind of talked about it briefly before the break. I was talking about my own experiences and how my mother was always ready not just for myself but my brother she knew the triggers our triggers she knew what to do um if we even started to wheeze like how to how to deal with those issues um and you know i'm here talking to to you all now so right, things worked out mm -hmm. yes so um now let's talk about mother's crafting and yes the mother's day and i got that in my head <laughs> definitely gotta uh, be ready for that mm -hmm. and Let's let's talk about the asthma action plan because right. that is so critical in the management of, of this disease. Children who have more persistent symptoms, right, um, you want to put them on medication to control their asthma, okay? And the main medication that we use are steroids that the children inhale mm -hmm. through either the machine, the nebulizer, or through a pump. And these medicines are very, very important because they go right into your airways, right where all that inflammation is, and they relieve the inflammation. <coughs> Got it. And I know sometimes parents, they hear the word steroid and they don't want to give it to their child, but it actually is very small doses of medication. Mm. It goes right to where it needs to go. And it's very important in controlling these symptoms. Very little side effects. You know, sometimes when children are really sick, we have to give them steroids mm -hmm. by mouth, okay? And those are bigger doses of the medication, and they can, if you have to take them for a long period of time by mouth, cause side effects. But most of the time, the medicines that we take by the pump uh, or the nebulizer mm -hmm. um, don't cause any significant side effects in children, and they have a great benefit in controlling the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important medication. Some children who have a lot of allergies, allergic what we call allergic rhinitis runny noses like we're seeing it now with the pollen count some mm -hmm. of those children benefit from other allergy medic medications to and that can secondarily help their asthma 
So these are very important medicines that kids should take every day. Yes. And then when they do get sick, because, you know, they're going to get sick, right? They're going to go to school and someone's going to give them a virus or they might go to the neighbor and kiss a cat and have asthma. Then those, then those other medications like albuterol, the short-acting medications, can be used. And so it's very important for a child and a family, the child, the parent, the kid, to have an asthma action plan where everything is written out for them. I mm -hmm. have to take this medicine this morning and this medicine this afternoon. And when I start to feel a little bit sick, I'm going to take my albuterol. And then if I get sicker, I'm going to take my albuterol more often. Mm -hmm. And so everything is written there so that you have a plan and you know what you're supposed to do with your child's asthma or the child learns what he has to do with his asthma. Now, I mentioned early, I had mentioned earlier about one of my employees who had to go to the emergency room because right. she was having an asthma attack. She didn't have her pump on her. Now, um, from my experience, and I'm just, from my experience of what I've witnessed, I want to say uh, TV, you know, individuals who start to have an asthma attack, you see them grab that pump and they take two hits of it and then they, they're good. You never actually see somebody ever having an asthma attack mm -hmm. and then go to the emergency room. At what point, I guess I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to, at what point would you use the inhaler and then at what point would you necessarily go to the ER? When you're about to drop dead? I mean, so, I, well, again, Mm -hmm. You would use your, again, this is something that you teach the parent, and it also depends on the child. Every child is different. There mm. are some kids who, they're fine, and then they very quickly get very sick with asthma. Some kids are like that. Other children, you get to know, if I give my child an albuterol treatment, and then maybe a half an hour later I give him another one, and I'm watching him, and I know he's okay, you can do some of that at home. Usually what we say, if you give the child two treatments within 20 minutes or within a half an hour mm -hmm. and your child is not better, then you seek medical attention. Gotcha. Mm. Gotcha. And, I, and I think, you know, um, it, it can be very clear as to when it's, when it's time to go because the child will let you know or you'll see from the distress in the child that it is time to go. Yeah. Um, because I, I remember... Um, you know, there were times when, yes, or most times, the vast majority majority of times, my inhaler worked or the nebulizer treatment worked. Right. Um, and I would feel much better um, after having those medications. However, there were other times where it was like I felt even tighter sometimes or I would feel a little bit better for a small amount of time. But then um, I would tighten right back up and, and have more difficulty breathing. And you can tell. Um, by looking at the child and even with from my experiences in seeing my brother struggle with the disease as well there is clear um, in the vast majority of cases when it's time to go to the emergency room because you will not get better um, and you need a more intense treatment or even just the monitoring um, in a controlled environment right and, and that's a very important point because if you give the child the albuterol or maybe you give two and the child is better and then a half an hour later he's really sick again you don't want to fool around, right? You should take mm -hmm. the child in. What happens a lot of times with our teenagers, our adolescents, this is why they have can get sicker is because they'll sit there and they'll use their pump, they'll use their pump, they'll use their pump every 20 minutes, every hour, every three hours, and they don't tell anybody, and then they get really, really sick mm -hmm. with their asthma, <coughs> you know. So, again, it's all about the asthma action plan. Mm -hmm. You and your pediatrician, you sit down, you discuss everything. This is what we're going to do, mm -hmm. and this is when we're going to call the mm -hmm. doctor, or this is when we're going to go to the emergency mm -hmm. room. Can a child actually OD, or can someone OD because they inhaled overdose, or, on, overdose the on the pump? Inhale. Is that possible? You don't really get an overdose, but one of the things that happens is a lot of these, medi a lot of these medications are based on our own natural things. Like mm -hmm. albuterol is very similar to our own adrenaline. Okay, and we sometimes people who are really sick, you know, from the emergency room, we give epinephrine. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Mm. Epinephrine is in us. Steroids. Steroids are based on our natural. We make steroids, our own natural steroids in our own body. So these medications are based on that. So what happens if you overuse your albuterol or use it over and over and over again? You get re your heart rate. You start racing. Yes. So your heart yep. rate, you know, goes way, way up. You actually can sometimes feel like your chest is tighter just because you're so anxious from this. So it's not really an overdose. But the other thing is it starts losing its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Right? Do it ten times, it's not gonna work anymore. And so this is and that's what becomes really important. One and, and um Dr. Denofo mentioned earlier that, you know, when a person starts to use an inhaler more and more and, and going back to the teenagers too, if you realize that I've been using this inhaler like uh, you know more than I typically do then it might be time to go 
um, to the emergency room or even to your primary care physician um, to to restructure the medications to a lot um, of teenagers don't tell like her. I know that's true. Well, that's like so true. Gotcha. So, so let's talk about um, some of the misconceptions that we talked about on um, activity. Well, actually, because I know the next thing I was going to say. Yeah. Because I have a myth right here. I do have a myth. Okay, what's your myth? Well, the myth, the, uh, the Are myth we gonna is. We're going to talk about the Loch Ness monster too. We're <laughs> <laughs> just going to talk about Adam Bigfoot. Myths. Hey. Bigfoot. <laughs> no, um, basically, the Knicks <laughs> can win in five. Right? Hey, oh, man, <laughs> please. Um, it, it basically, knuckleheads. it's basically that um, if if I have asthma, if a person has asthma. They cannot do any strenuous activities or they can't play sports at all. Is that the exact opposite for mm. most kids? We want kids who have asthma to exercise. We want them to get out and run around oh, and seriously? do all okay. their and live their life. Absolutely. You know, okay. absolutely. They shouldn't be mm -hmm. in hospitals. You know? yeah. Now, if you have really severe asthma, mm -hmm. there may be certain sports that you can't play. But most children who have mild to moderate asthma should do everything. As a matter of fact, we encourage them to get mm. out and run around mm. and open up their airways and do things. You may have to take your medication mm -hmm. before you play a sport, but you should do it. So, so There are some okay. kids who only have what we call exercise-induced asthma. Mm -hmm. People don't really understand quite what that's about, why exercise in some children triggers a spasm. Mm -hmm. But some kids do that, and that's not a very common thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's less common, but there are some people who are like that. Most kids who have underlying, a little bit of asthma underlying, and then when they exercise, yeah, you're going to, you know, you're going to cough more. You may even wheeze a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if you take your medications and you're in good control, you should be able to do your activities. Would you, uh, would you pro probably oh. say that the exercise strengthens your lungs, or does that make sense? Exercise does what? Strengthen your lungs or make your lungs stronger? It makes you stronger, yeah, okay. because now a lot of times what happens is people will try exercising, right? And they'll get short of breath and they'll huff and puff and they think they're having asthma. But a lot of times it's just because they're out of shape, right? <laughs> no, true, let's be kids, real, yeah. No, I mean, so no that's true. Yeah. You know, no, and, even, and even kids sometimes, the kid will decide I want to go out for the basketball team or I want to play football. And, you know, they haven't even run around the block once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you want the child to build up. Right? If you want to play, especially a running sport, right? mm. if you want to play basketball yes. or soccer or football, you want to build yourself up. And usually if you build yourself up, build yourself up, you won't feel that sense. Now, everybody gets a little winded when you do anything. That's right. right. Yep. But there's a difference between being winded and really feeling like you can't catch your breath. So, again, it's something to discuss with your pediatrician mm -hmm. uh, or whoever's managing your asthma. But, no, kids should should get out. The whole point is to not be home sitting on your nebulizer. You know, you should be out. You should be in school every day. Yes. You should be going to gym, running up and down the basketball court, doing whatever. And with well-controlled asthma, um, if we talk about we got the asthma action plan in place, we understand our triggers, um, this is possible. And we'll, we'll talk more on that when we come back. You're listening to Health in Harlem on WHCR 90.3 FM New York, the voice of Harlem. One last time, ladies and gentlemen, you can call us at 212-650-6903. That's 212-650-6903. Don't be shy. And if you want, we can ask the question for you. You don't have to go on the air because I know that's something that a little some people are a little um, hesitant to do. But we do want to address your, your concerns. We want to address your questions. Um, what you're listening to Health in Harlem. We'll be right back. Stay with us. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. I love jazz. I love jazz. The whole world knows I love jazz. Listen up, jazz fans. I want you to get excited about your love for jazz. This is Dee Ramey, host of I Love Jazz a new music and talk show where jazz fans meet to spread their love for jazz. Put I Love Jazz on your jazz calendar every two weeks on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. And tune in to hear a WHCR exclusive, the I Love Jazz fan theme song. The Jazz Challenge is on. There is no greater love for jazz than Uptown in Harlem. The future of jazz is in your hands. Reach for I Love Jazz at WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Shooby dooby, I love jazz. I love jazz. 
WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Welcome back to Health in Harlem, Welcome ladies back. and gentlemen. I'm Maurice Selby. And I am Sean Shivers. And tonight we have Dr. Elaine Denolfo from Harlem Hospital. She's a general pediatrician, and she is telling us what we need to know about asthma. Now, right before the break... Uh, we were talking about the the misconception that children with asthma can't be out there playing in the fields, playing in the park and and enjoying themselves. But that is the complete opposite. Um, and one thing I wanted to, to add to that was just to we still want to be aware of our triggers, because I remember um, growing up um, and even to today, to a certain extent, um, my trigger, as I said earlier, was cold, dry air, cold, dry air. And I was on the track team in high school. I'd be perfectly fine working out with the rest of the team, going to the meets, participating, playing football as well in high school um, and didn't have that many problems. However, when it was, you know, 30 degrees, 25 degrees and it was dry outside, dry out there and we'd be running around, I would feel that tightness coming on again. So we do want to be aware of those triggers um uh, but remember if we got the action plan in place the asthma action plan um and we know our triggers we can we can still be active we don't have to limit our children so that's that's something that's major now speaking about triggers let's talk about one of the ultimate triggers and something that is um pretty much modifiable we talked about some of the other triggers the the roach infestations the mice and these are things that sometimes and, and let's be real here in central harlem these are things that out of some people it's out of some people's control um in terms of the these issues that we're dealing with um the 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 waste disposal plants and the fumes that are coming over um in the atmosphere but when we talk about smoking this is something that that can be um, adjusted in terms of lifestyles. So, so can you talk about the influence of smoking um, on asthma? Right. So in adolescents and adults who smoke, you're just, you know, trashing your airway. You know, you're, you're taking in a multitude of chemicals that are going to trigger asthma, mm. besides all the other things they're going to do to your lungs directly. When we talk about children who are in households with asthma, there are a lot you know, in households with people who smoke, mm -hmm. you know, smoke is a huge trigger of asthma. Uh, upper respiratory tract infections, ear infection, okay, all kinds mm -hmm. of things related to smoking. And parents will say, I don't smoke in the house, or I smoke in the yes. bathroom, or I blow the smoke out the window. Well, the smoke is on you, right? Got it's it. on your clothes. Mm -hmm. It's in your hair. You pick up your child. You hug your child. He's sm he or she is smelling. Isn't that there a commercial on, on that or a public service announcement through Bloomberg about oh that? God, Bloomberg has yeah, about, <laughs> about he, he, no, tons of really, them. He really has an anti-smoking campaign he, yes. that I personally admire because uh, I same here. Same here. I really admire some of the, some of those things. I mean, of course, he has his healthcare initiatives as a whole. I can say this is a lot a of them are really good. Mm -hmm. So yes. sure you know, and also a lot of our parents in Harlem are very young adults. So for their own health, you're 20 years old and you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and you have a child, mm -hmm. you need to quit smoking. And there are lots of ways to do that. Harlem Hospital has a wonderful, you know, smoking cessation program. Yes. You, there are patches. There is gum. There are all the kinds of ways cigarettes. to quit mm -hmm. smoking, you know, if you want to make the effort to do that. That's right. So smoking around, mm -hmm. around your child is just not good. You know, right. now what we do tell some parents who are trying to quit is if you're going to smoke outside the house, the minute you come in the house, you got to take your clothes off. That's right. Your clothes reek of smoke, and you should actually get in the shower and then pick up your child. But quitting mm. smoking is really the best way. And, and it's a challenge, and, and that's one thing that we acknowledge, right? This is a challenge is. for well, the parent. However, this is something that it, it just has to it has to be done and we have the support systems here in the city we got right. the 311 hotline right. um uh, as dr denopo said we have yes well, well you know State what i mean hotline. i mean you make a very good point but one thing is knowledge like a lot of stuff that you're saying right now i wasn't even aware of i know there's probably a lot of parents out there mm -hmm. who what who's not even aware of this and that's as, as and then as we always say 
as far as this radio show, as far as we are informing the public. You know, Bloomberg is informing the public because I think a lot of times the parents just don't even know. And I mean, listen, it's not easy to quit smoking. My dad was a two pack a day smoker. Mm. And I still have nightmares about when he quit smoking. It's very difficult to quit smoking. But now you have lots of ways to help you, and it's really worth it. It's yeah. worth it for your child's health, and it's worth it for your own health. You know, as a parent, you have to be there for your child growing up. Right. You need to quit. And look at it, if we look at it from an economic standpoint, yeah. you know, one thing we save one. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's, no, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I guess there's legislation going on now. Yeah, you have to be 21. To be yeah. They want it to be 21. But also, think <coughs> about it. There's less sick days for the child because there will be Absolutely. less um, asthma exacerbations. You save money per pack that you right. don't buy. Right. Um, so this is this could be very, very beneficial. Um, and also, let's talk about the health of the parent as well. You'll That's be there. You'll about, be around you know? to take care of your child as they grow up. You'll have less mm -hmm. chance of of developing the hypertension, less chances of a stroke, less chance of a heart attack, less chances of lung cancer down the line. You'll actually be able to see your child grow up right. um, and flourish. Mm -hmm. So this is this is something that will benefit everyone mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, and we, we just want you to, to take that step. So take that step. So quick. so if there are parents out there right now who's listening mm -hmm. and they Including do include marijuana room. Sorry, I had to throw that in. Hey, hey. Right. Just cigarettes, right? Yeah. Um if there's parents out there right now who do want to make their change or just need that support or that help, um who could they call? What could they do? Support groups, anything like that? There's support groups from smoking cessation. Like I said, Harlem has a smoking yep. cessation. Home Hospital has one. 311, New York State Smokers Quit Line. You can get free patches, free gum. I mean, there's a lot of ways if you mm -hmm. really want to mm -hmm. do it to help you quit. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just, now what's the number at Harlem Hospital they want to call? Um, I, the smoking cessation is 212-939-8222. That's that's nine two one three two nine, nine three nine, three nine eight, eight two two two. two. Eight two two two. You can't forget those numbers. No, you cannot. <laughs> and also, speaking of support groups, there's also an an asthma support group. Right. Uh, Harlem Hospital. Um, our former chairman, Dr. Vincent Hutch Hutchinson. Department yes, Dr. Hutchinson. Chairman, Dr. Ooh, yeah. Hutchinson. He is the man. He <laughs> is the man. <laughs> he was on the show before. Yep. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. He initiated the uh, the Harlem Initiative for for um, community outreach for children That's right. um, in Harlem with asthma. And, and they took leadership in getting the bus depots cleaned up and doing a lot of things for the environment. Absolutely. And so we have this um, asthma outreach program called um, Asthma Initiative and Relief, AIR, A-I-R. And basically it's a community outreach program available to all children and families with kids up to the age of 17. And it offers educational services and it offers help in terms of the home environment. It's really mm -hmm. meant to be home based. Mm -hmm. So a community outreach person goes into the home, does an assessment, looking for triggers, looking for molds, mm -hmm. seeing how you, we can help mm -hmm. the parent improve the quality of the home the child is living in. They do education, reviewing how you use your nebulizer, how you use your pump and your spacer going over the medication the child is taking. They also will go into the schools and help this, the school and the school nurse manage your child's asthma. Got it. And they also refer help with referrals and they also do some pro bono legal work. Mm -hmm. And you, you're in the program for a year and uh, you meet quarterly. Now, there are some parents who you know don't want people coming into their home. Mm -hmm. You can also participate by just meeting with the worker and doing the educational part of it and those other things. Got it. Um, if you, you know, if you're hesitant to have someone come into your home, and it's open to everybody in this part in, in Central Harlem, if you uh, would like to participate in that. So how would how would a, a parent get in touch can with refer you? Mm -hmm. And there's actually a number that they can call. Yes. Six four six five four five two two six three. What's that number again? Six four six five four five. Two two six three. Take advantage. Oh right, Take advantage. Yeah. it's a great program. Mm -hmm. You so know what? I've learned, and you know, you hear the word asthma every day, mm -hmm. but I've learned so much about what asthma is right now, and how we can get control yeah. of it yeah. as well. Yeah. And so one thing, and one thing that we always say, we, I'm sorry to cut you off. That's now, all right. Is that um, we always we haven't said in a long time. Don't be stingy. You know, what yes. I'm saying all this valuable information. Share it with your friend, your counterpart. 
Someone you see on the train or the bus. Or well, you're, the the, you're at the water cooler hey, tomorrow. You don't got nothing else to talk about. The Knicks ain't win. So hey, you might as well talk, talk about, about asthma. <laughs> <laughs> talk about asthma. No, but for real, there are people out there, and I know that this might even listen to the audience that knows of a person in their family that might have asthma. They might have asthma themselves, mm-hmm. or you know of a coworker, a friend, a, a colleague that has a child with asthma. Somebody out mm-hmm. there knows some, somebody with asthma, and just... Going out there mm-hmm. and say, yo, you know what I heard on the radio mm-hmm. last night, man? You know, it could be you, kids, you smoking yeah. outside on your stoop and then going into the house. Yeah. And when we take our smoke breaks, you could be hurting mm-hmm. your kid, you know, mm-hmm. and or telling their kids that they reaching can't play out. Sports. Yeah. Right. Something like so, that when they really can. So all of these, Absolutely. we can all help each other out. It takes a community, right? What do they say? It takes a village to raise a child. It's a village to raise well, a child. Well, guess what? This is the village. Yes. We're talking right now and, and talking to the village. So go out and, and spread the wealth mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. this knowledge. Mm-hmm. Now, um, as we wrap up, Dr. Denofo, do you have, what is the most important thing um, that our listening audience needs to take away from tonight's show? Uh, that asthma is a disease that you live with, that you can control. Okay, and that if you have a good relationship with your pediatrician, that uh, your kids can go out and have a, a, a healthy life All and, right. and a happy life. And, and have that action plan and in place. And have that asthma action plan and get your flu shot when oh, you need yes. to. We forgot yes. flu shots. Get your flu shot when you need to. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, talk about asthma with your doctor. Sounds like a plan. So we want to thank you very oh, much for joining us tonight. My and pleasure. we need you to come back. Right. A downstate Anytime. alum, ladies That's and gentlemen. Right. we got to stick <laughs> together. <laughs> um, and I also want to thank my man, Sean Shivers, at the board. Boy, Mo. You're welcome, my brother. Thank it's my pleasure to be here Beautiful every love. single you, week. Yes. And uh, just want to make this last announcement. Inspector Rodney Harrison, commanding officer of the 32nd Precinct, is initiating a mentorship opportunity for high school aged youths ranging from 15 to 18 years of age. Chosen mentees will be given the opportunity to shadow Inspector Harrison throughout his day-to-day duties, attend Har- uh, Harlem community meetings, and experience an intimate knowledge of the operations of a police department. The program will run monthly, and new candidates will be selected at the beginning of each cycle. Upon completion, at- candidates will have access to a letter of recommendation from the inspector. Um, and they can use this for all of their future endeavors. Yeah. All prospective candidates will be asked uh, three to four questions over a phone interview. So this is really simple to get involved in. If you're interested or know somebody that's interested, call 212-690-6337. That's 212-690-6337 mm-hmm. between the hours of 2 and 3.30 p.m. Um, 